All right, welcome everyone. Um, in this video, we're going to take a look at some more Yara basics, and this time focus on string detections. In particular, we're going to look at the difference between ASCII and wide character strings, as well as a little bit of obfuscation that you'll likely encounter when, uh, particularly if you're reverse engineering any sort of malicious file. Um, so to get started, we're going to have a very simple sample program. Um, you'll be able to find this in my GitHub, so I'll make sure to add a link here in the description so you can grab the code here, take a look at it. You can compile it. Uh, I've covered compiling programs from source on a number of videos now, so I won't cover that here. Uh, suffice it to say, though, you can just grab Visual Studio Community and, and then use the developer command prompt. Now, this program uh, exhibits the, the main characteristics of strings that I want to focus on. So we have three strings, string one, two, and three. The first one is defined as a wide character pointer. So this, this is going to point to uh, you know data that represents wide character strings. And this is the syntax in order to do that. Now, a wide character string, as you'll see throughout this video, is, is simply a, a string that uses multiple bytes, two bytes for each character. If we look at the next string, so this is defining a, a, a char pointer to this data, so a pointer to a string. Each character in this string is only a single byte. Um, so there's a there's a significant difference under you know how those are stored in the binary and and then how different functions as well as some of our tools will process them. The final string is simply an XOR encoded or an XOR encrypted string, and this is the syntax using a backslash X and then two hex digits. Each hex digit is four bits. Both of those together is eight bits or one byte. So this is just how we can represent. You can represent any byte value using this notation. But in particular, it's helpful if we're trying to represent byte values that, that we, can't, we can't represent using an ASCII character. Um, now, what I did in order to get this sequence of bytes in this particular string here is to take the original string and XOR each byte with a hard-coded key of hex 97. And the result of that is what you see here. Um, XOR encryption is very straightforward because now all you have to do is take this resulting value and XOR it with the same key and you'll get the original value. And that's all this decrypt function is going to do is it's going to XOR this with that original hard-coded key um, and now that will recover the string so that it can be utilized. In this case, I'm just simply printing it. Um, so this is a very, while this is very straightforward, it's a very common technique because this prevents us from recovering and, and detecting the string unless we figure out a way to decrypt it statically, or we look for you know these strings in memory because the malware or whatever is trying to hide this information, um, it'll only decrypt that string when it's needed. Uh, now, there's a lot of variations of that, and, and, and just talking about string obfuscation is a, is a pretty in-depth topic in and of itself. So I'm just trying to give you the basics here. I'm kind of glossing over a lot of things, but this hopefully gives you an idea as to what you're up against when you're, when you're starting to create your Yara detections. Okay, um, as far as the program, it's just going to print, print string one, print string two, print string three in its encrypted form, decrypts it in memory, and then prints it again to show us the recovered version. Okay, if we run the program, you'll see the output as expected. We have our wide character string, our ASCII string, we have the series of, of bytes that really don't represent anything uh, recognizable at this point, and then we have that decrypted string, which says this is an encrypted string. Well, it was, it's now decrypted, uh, but hopefully you get the point. Now, keep, keep in mind here, when you're looking at this output, um, if we don't know anything about how this data is stored, then it's just gonna look like a string. And that can cause complications in our pattern matching that if you don't recognize this as a wide character string, and you try to match it as an ASCII string, it won't match, and, you're, and therefore your rule won't be working the way that you intend it, and vice versa. And so this is important. Now, um, how can we recover these strings? Um, I'm gonna use Ida Pro in, in just a minute to talk a little bit more about that, that underlier, underlying composition, but a very common technique is to use, just use strings. Now, I installed strings using Chaco and the sysinternal suite. So you can see here, I've got strings from sysinternals, this is a little bit different implementation than what you'll find on, with strings on Linux. And the, the probably the most notable is that just by default, this version of strings is looking for both ANSI and Unicode strings. So it's looking for both our ASCII, our single byte strings, and our multi-byte strings. You can see this in that if we run strings on our sample binary, okay, we don't really want to do that. Let's do this. Let's grep for this is. 
that now we have both the wide character and the ASCII, right? A again, if, if the strings utility, the utility that you're using isn't looking for both, and also I think helping you to differentiate, right? Right now, if, if I didn't have this very obvious text, it wouldn't be clear which is which. And so there are plenty of tools out there that will say, hey, I found I found these ASCII strings, I found these, these wide character strings. So that can help you in how you write your rule. Um, but without that, it, it's hard to say for sure. And there's probably some configuration in, in strings to go through and say only find ASCII strings and only find wide character, and then you can compare the difference. So it's up to you to, to utilize that information, those tools properly. I just wanted you to know that. Uh, of course, we don't see the third string because right now in its static form, in the compiled form in that binary, in that executable, it's still XOR encrypted. And so w without knowing how to try to brute force that or, or decrypt it, then you know, we just, our strings utility isn't smart enough to figure that out and it shouldn't be. Okay, so how do we take this knowledge and turn it into a rule? Well, before we do that, I th I'd feel a little remiss if we didn't spend at least a minute in IDA Pro. Um, now, we don't really need IDA for this. Um, I'm just trying to provide a little bit better uh, context as to showing you how IDA explores and, and defines strings for you. Uh, as, as you, you know, Hopefully, you've watched some of my other videos where we talk about you know, writing rules and, and getting into IDA. What IDA provides is the context in which a string is utilized. If we look at this, we don't really know where a string is. Even, even if it told us where the address of the string was defined, it sometimes can be hard to understand exactly what is the purpose, what is the context. Well, IDA provides that. So inside of this, um, just taking that demo.exe and, and disassembling it with IDA, IDA drops us into main, we can see our three strings are being moved into stack variables before they are then used with a call to printf. Now, uh, the fact that this isn't identified as printf and, and some other issues here, there's our call to decrypt, you know, those are those are more IDA specific issues. But the point is that we could use, you know, our insight into the actual program analysis to figure out more context around what those strings are. And, and, and therefore, does that string make a good candidate? Um, do you need to do this? No, right? You might be able to just dump strings on a binary and say, these are unique enough and I think they're good good anchors for my rule. Okay, but my primary point was to look at the actual composition, like how how is the data for that string stored? So we can double click on where that label is defined. You'll see it's defined in the data section. And Ida is saying that this is a multi-byte string, right? It's UTF-16, LE stands for Little Indian, and there is the string. It looks like an ASCII string, but it's not. and how can we kind of analyze that further is if we just you know, can keep this, this location highlighted and switch to the hex view, you'll see there's our string as if we were looking at this in a hex editor and there's the bytes, right? So there's the first byte, seven, four, followed by a null byte. Then the next byte, six, eight for the actual character followed by a null byte. And, and you'll notice off to the side here, that's why we have all of these extra dots, right? That's the character plus the null byte because this, this ver you know, this language set, you know, the English language set isn't large enough to need multi-byte, um, you know, multi-byte characters. Some languages that have a lot of different symbols or characters, that's something that they need. If we look below that, we'll have our ASCII string, and you can see there's our byte for. Uh, for T and then 6.8 and then 6.9 and 7.3, right? It's all the same values as the, the wide character version above, except that it's only a single byte per character. So now if we think about the tools, a lot of times strings utilities are very straightforward. They just look for a series of characters that meets a minimum length that are in the range of printable ASCII characters. And they'll know that the string ends when, it's, when, it, when it reaches a null byte. That null byte terminates the string. Well, with a wide character, we have a null byte with every character. And so if the utility doesn't understand that or you're not telling it to look specifically for both multi and ASCII characters or single byte characters, then it can get confused. And it'll say, hey, this, this isn't a string because the sequence of bytes isn't long enough. There's only one byte that falls in that printable range and then it terminates. And then there's another and then it terminates, right? So that can cause some complications. The, uh, the last string is just, again, the sequence of bytes defined for our XOR encrypted data. And because IDA doesn't really know what to do with that, as you see in the IDA view, 
Um, it's just the finding that as, as it, it knows that this there's a pointer to this location, but it doesn't know what the data represents. Okay, what about writing a rule? Well, I'm going to go ahead and open up a terminal here. So hopefully this can help uh, with just a little less back and forth between windows. Um, rule is going to be very straightforward. We'll have a, a, a very simple name here, uh, some meta information just so that I can get this added to the GitHub, um, and then strings and condition. Now the condition, again, I'll keep very straightforward. I'll just say all of them. So no matter how many strings we define here, they all have to match in order for our rule to match. Um, and then the strings, we're just going to explore three or four or five different variations of how we could match on these strings. Okay, so the first one um, is just our variable name, um, S1, S2, S3. I'm just going to use that convention, and I'm just going to match on the string in its entirety. This is an ASCII string. Now, after you define the string, wrapping it in double quotes, you have a number of different modifiers available. One is ASCII. Uh, now, you don't necessarily need ASCII. This is telling Yara, the Yara engine, to only match this as an ASCII string, so that single byte character. Um, but that's the default. So if you don't define that, then Yara, according to the docs, will assume ASCII, and there you go. Now, we can mix and match ASCII and wide and have a string defined as both. So that's an opportunity where you might want to actually define ASCII. Um, beyond that, the, you have another modifier called no case, and no case is just as it sounds. It's saying, don't worry about the casing. So if I did a capital A here, and the string in the binary does not have a capital A or an uppercase A, then it wouldn't matter because the, the no case statement essentially normalizes bo bo you know, both strings um, so that it doesn't matter. Okay, so depending on you know, what you anticipate the, the, the nature of your string to be, if you think it's a very distinct, very unique, it's very critical, and the casing is important, then you would probably want to skip this. Um, if you don't think it matters, well, then you can alleviate some of that uncertainty uh, and, and go ahead and, and just use the no case modifier. Okay, I'm not going to worry about the no case, and um, only we're only going to focus on ASCII and wide at this point. Okay, uh, we have our string, right? And I just copied that right out of the binary, so I'm, I'm fairly confident that that'll work. Now we'll go down to our terminal, and we'll, let's see here. There we go. We've got our Yara executable, we've got our Yara file, we've got our target sample to match against, and there is a match, just as we probably expected. Right? So that's indicating that our rule by rule name matched in this file. Okay, what about white character? Well, I'll define another condition here. Um, this is a wide char string. And let's say we do this, we define it as ASCII, or we didn't define it at any, as anything, so it would take the default of ASCII. Um, what we're saying now is that both of these strings have to match per the condition, and if we run this, you see there is no match, because this is a wide character string, and Yara is not looking for it as a wide character string. Okay, so to, to correct that, then we can use the keyword wide. And now, if we run our test again, you can see that it did indeed match. So Yara strings basics match because we have both our ASCII and our wide character equivalent. Okay, what about our third? Well, let's just define this and probably, again, we don't need ASCII, but I'll just, I think it's it's gonna be helpful for this demo to, to use the two to make sure that we are, are focused on that. Um, we, we, I mean, I'm helping to dis, you know discriminate between the two. This is, we know, is basically a wide character, or I'm sorry, an ASCII string because I'm not accounting for multiple bytes per character. And um, we add that to the condition. Now, if we run our rule, you'll see again, it's not going to match because the string is encrypted. And in order for this to be able to match on that string, it needs to be in its decrypted state. There is one other modifier that I think is definitely worth pointing out here and that is the XOR modifier. So what the XOR modifier will do is it will search for strings with a single byte XOR applied to them. So every single possible byte will be applied to this string using a single byte, and then it'll look for that string in the binary. So making that modification and adding this string, you can see now it matches. All right, so that's pretty cool. Uh, so this can be really helpful if you know the 
you know, the, the decry- decrypted or the, the decoded state of a string, and you can reliably recognize its encrypted state in the binary, right? So this could be something that could also improve the type of signature detections that you're creating in Yara. Okay, so, so this works only because of the relatively simple uh, application of that single byte XOR key. Right? Multi-byte XOR keys or a more complex obfuscation or encryption of those strings, and we still have a problem. Although, again, if you can recognize the, the byte pattern and it's reliable, then you can still match strings off of it. And one way to do that, so the last thing, you know, kind of the last way I want to talk about uh, matching strings is that we have the same ability in Yara to match off of byte patterns. So let's say that we go back to, let's go to our Oops, our hex view for our ASCII string. This is an ASCII string. You can see there are the bytes, seven, four, six, eight, six, nine, seven, three. Very similarly, uh, the XOR just did the XOR computation for us. And because it created every permutation, it has this sequence of bytes, obviously, because it matched for us. Um, but let's take our ASCII string, seven, four, six, eight, six, nine. And I've got a little cheater thing here because I didn't want to Uh, I didn't want to have to type this out. You can see, and this is a little long, so I'm going to turn on line wraps. Um, and I did a, a poor job of pasting, so let me just fix that. And we don't need the double quotes. Okay, there we go. Finally cleaned up. So, so what we were able to do here is if we define um, open and close parentheses, then you can define byte values for each byte that you're looking for. So if our string in this case is the wide character, we have 74 with the null byte, 68 with the null byte. Uh, we could replace those null bytes and then it would be the ASCII equivalent. And now if we try to match the string, it's going to match. It's of course redundant with S2 at this point, um, but it does show that there is a way to, to match on those hex bytes. So very similarly, you can see with this, with our XOR, so let's define another string, S5, and clean up that, there we go, right? Those are the byte values for that XOR string. And um, we don't really need this one now, so let's try to match again. And there we go, we've got a match. Okay. So this is the, the basics, the foundations for, for strings and then the difference between ASCII and WIDE. We talked a little bit about modifiers, ASCII and WIDE modifiers, the XOR modifier, um, and then hexadecimal strings. So this is just representing, um, again, byte values using this, this, this notation. So using hexadecimal values. Um, there's still a lot more to cover. We still have the ability to add in wildcards. There's regular expressions. There is um, all sorts of modifiers in, in terms of how we're looking for patterns in not only strings, but even in code because uh, binary content are, are executable programs. Here we go back to IDA and go back to main. Let's just look at opcodes. Uh, this this data is stored in byte values, right? That represents the instructions in the data of the program. And so that's another way of looking at creating pattern matching signatures, um, not, not using the strings, but using the actual sequence of code. So still a lot to cover, but hopefully um, just to get something a little bit succinct, talking about the basics of strings here, that this is helpful and uh, helps to establish a, a further baseline for your ability as you're writing Yara. Um, if you have any questions, comments, please feel free to leave them below. I, I look forward to seeing your uh, any sort of feedback you have and any questions and anything I can help with. Otherwise, stay tuned. And future videos here with Yara will continue to explore all of the things that we talked about today as future items. So talk to you then.